Welcome, everyone. Uh, this is Kevin Johnson, coordinator for the Southern Rockies uh, Landscape Conservation Cooperative. Uh, and thank you for participating in the, the first webinar of uh, many that uh, we, we anticipate this LCC uh, holding and sponsoring. Uh, today we have uh, a presentation uh, from Wendy Peterman. Wendy is a GIS specialist, a soil scientist in the climate change modeling team with the Conservation Biology Institute. Uh, Wendy is a PhD student at Oregon State University in the Department of Forest Engineering. And Wendy will be giving a presentation today on some work that she's been doing, uh, work that was uh, funded in part uh, by the uh, Bureau of Reclamation's uh, Water Smart Funds through a proposal with the Southern Rockies Landscape Conservation Cooperative. Uh, I would like to ask that you please hold questions until uh, the end of the presentation. If you would like, you can um, use the Q&A button on the screen and enter a question so that you don't lose the thought, and we will try and address the question at the end of the presentation. Uh, with that, uh, I'd also like to uh, ask that you please mute your phones, and if you do not have a mute, you can press star six to mute and unmute your phones. So with that, Wendy, um, you can uh, take it away. Okay, thank you, Kevin. This is Wendy Peterman, and I'm doing my presentation using soil vulnerability to predict changes in vegetation cover in response to climate change which is in progress. It's a, um, been a two-year project that is about to wrap up this summer. And um, I'm the PI on it, and I also um, work with the leader of our climate change group, Dr. Dominique Bachelet, and um, her climate modelers on vegetation modeling. So a brief introduction of our organization. I work for Conservation Biology Institute. We're in Corvallis, Oregon. And we have a variety of services that we offer to scientific and conservation communities, educational communities. Um, we do conservation assessment and planning, so we have a number of scientists who work directly with managers and organizations to um, assess landscape issues, ecological issues, and do um, JS and uh, analysis and remote sensing to help make assessments and um, develop plans for um, approaching different environmental problems in those landscapes. We have ecological modelers who do a lot of climate modeling in different scenarios. Um, the person in this picture right here is Dr. Alexander Seifert, who is a fire modeler who's very prominent with USGS. And um, then we have our online platform, which is a tool that people can use to share and analyze uh, spatial data in NetCDF uh, grid or shapefile format. Um, you can share data there, you can download it, you can explore it, you can overlay it, I'll, and I'll do a little bit of um, demonstrating of that in a bit. We have conservation data set development and analysis. We have GIS analysts who develop our protected areas database, which is also available on databasing, and people who do modeling that help to um, predict species distribution changes in light of different land management practices and climate change. And then we have our science support and education where we do outreach to academic groups and try to communicate science in a way that is meaningful to the average person so that they can make educated choices and decisions. This is me. As you said, I'm a GIS specialist with Conservation Biology Institute. I'm also a soil scientist in the climate change modeling team at CBI. So mostly what I do is integrate just about anything that has to do with soils or a soil question into um, models and questions that have to do with how climate change might be affecting vegetation. I'm also a PhD student at Oregon State University in the Department of Forest Engineering, where I'm studying how to integrate more soil data and information into models of forest productivity and vegetation change. So the main issue at hand that I like to study is um, forest mortality, both locally and globally. Uh, alerted to this issue through Mike Allen of the USGS and a paper that he wrote in 2010 that talked about and documented the forest mortality that was happening around the world in response to major droughts. The forest mortality and vegetation change seem to be happening in response to a number of different environmental factors, 
pointing pollution, which damages the stomata of the plants and makes it difficult for them to respond appropriately to changes in precipitation and temperature. There are heat waves, which just cause massive embolism in the trees, cavitation, inability for the trees to respond um, in a hydrologically appropriate manner. Pest and insect outbreaks, which are happening both in response to the trees becoming more vulnerable and also to changes in the environmental factors, which are making the habitats more hospitable to the pests. And, of course, extended drought, which has been experienced a great deal in the southwestern United States, and you've seen a lot of dieback of pinion pines and some difficulties with ponderosas in that region, and aspen as well. So what does soil have to do with this? As the climate is warming, the soil the water becomes a very major issue. And the, there are drought thresholds that can vary with the soil characteristics, and that's specifically what I studied. Here are a few examples of how the water moves through the soil to help understand this a little bit. When you have a really loose, granular structure of the soil, which is over here on the left, we can see that the water moves through in a fairly direct path. There is um, very little obstruction to the water, and it can move easily with gravity flow because there are plenty of fairly equally sized pore spaces. We have more prismatic soil structure, which has these long columns of soil, what we might call clods. Um, you get a different path of the water again. And it has a, a hard time moving horizontally in the soil. So roots would have a hard time accessing the soil if they spread horizontally. You have a blocky structure. The soil, uh, the water can move fairly easily through the soil, but again, it does, you know, take some more twists and turns to get there. If you have a platy soil, which would be common in a very compacted soil that's been walked on or driven on a great deal, especially when it's wet, then you have a very tortuous path for the water to get through, and it tends to stay in the upper layers and doesn't um, infiltrate very far into the soil. Another option that you can have, which is very common in the southwest, which some of you are familiar with, caliche, is a buildup of calcium in the soil or some other mineral, which can, or clay, which can cause a water-limiting layer. So the soil itself might be fairly deep, but it might have this accumulation that's pretty high up in the soil horizon, which would prevent the water from getting deeper into the soil for roots to access. Here's another concept. Um, if you have a very sandy soil, it's very easy for the water to pass very quickly into the soil horizon and get into the deeper horizons and be more accessible to plants for a brief period of time. It's also a little bit more susceptible to evaporation when it's sandy because it's easier for air to have contact with the water in the pores. Whereas if you have a clay soil, which is mostly governed by capillary action, the water infiltrates into the soil very, very, very slowly, and it can also be spreading horizontally. So these both have their advantages and disadvantages for different kinds of plants. In a paper that I wrote last year when I was studying pinion pines and specifically how they responded to the massive drought that was happening in the, in the southwest uh, in the last decade, especially in 2002 to 2004, what I found was that most commonly the pinion pines died back on soils that had an available soil water holding capacity of less than 100 millimeters, and after the soils got... Um, deeper and um, a little more sandy and could hold more water um, throughout the months that were dry, then uh, the, the trees were much, were much more able to persist. So that's a pattern on the landscape that could actually be observed and mapped and possibly be used um, for managers to go out and look at their soils and see if they're going to be especially vulnerable to die back. This is another uh, brief study that I did that related um, mineral accumulation, soil climate, soil texture, and soil order or soil development to the um, dieback of the trees. And I, I found that there were definite connections between the um, buildup of calcium in the soil, the um, historic climate that the soil usually is used to, the texture of the soil, and the development of the soil. So these are things that could be used to actually map and predict the dieback. So if you look at this map, I made a, a risk map of very low risk to high risk. 
And in the areas where it's really high risk, you can see that the black here is where the, the dieback was documented by the Forest Service of the Pinion Juniper Woodlands. So I put these things, all of those layers that observe more data into a um, one map together. Hey, Wendy. Map. Wendy, this is Kevin. Um, you broke up a little bit there. Could you start over again with this particular slide, please? Yes, certainly. Can you hear me fine? Yes. Okay. Okay, great. So what I was explaining on this one is that I had taken the information that I got um, showed in this slide about um, how the soil development, texture, climate, and um, mineral accumulations relate to the dieback of the pinion juniper woodland. I took the observed mortality data from the Forest Service and I put that together in a model with the climate, the texture, the order, and the accumulations and came out with this forecast or risk map of dieback of the pinion junipers. So the objectives of this particular study for the Southern Rockies LTC is to produce decision support tools. So that includes spatial data of soil characteristics and the soil water resources, and projections to show trends in the soil dynamics, make all of this freely available through data.org. The second thing is to produce soil vulnerability maps, so to actually say, give some indications of where soils are most sensitive to drought in the Southern Rockies LCC and where managers restoration and mitigation strategies in the face of drought and change. So the progress to date is that, first of all, I've gathered the soils data for the four U.S. states within the Southern Rockies LCC. I say four because our entire states would be southern, which would be Utah, Mexico, and Arizona. Um, but there's just a little bit of Wyoming and Idaho in there, maybe some Nevada. I've um, gathered all of the CERCO um, data available for those states and, and uh, aggregated them into one large data set and then used digital soil mapping techniques to infill the gaps because there are large gaps that haven't been surveyed in that area, especially on military bases. And po posted all of this stuff on databasin.org. Here's an example of the gallery that you can go to, databasin.org. If you just go in your web browser, databasin.org, and type up here in the search SR space LCC, you'll get a list of the data sets in this gallery. Go into the gallery and see all of the data that are available for the Southern Rockies LCC study. Right here, this is showing on the first page of the data of the gallery all of the vulnerability maps that I've made for each um, condition of the soils that we're looking at to study. This is an example of one of the data sets. I have to divide the study area into a north and south half um, because the data sets are so large that were generated um, that I can't upload them in the entirety for the whole region. So there's a Southern Rockies LCC north folder and a Southern Rockies LCC south folder. And the data sets that just show the vulnerability for one particular trait are put in maps together so you can see them in the entire LCC. And I'll show you an example of that in a moment. So this particular data set shows the um, NRCS uh, KW factor, which is a predicted soil water erodibility factor they um, have in their data set. And this is the uh, all of the county surveys that are aggregated together for this field. And then the gray shows the gaps where they don't have any surveys or data. And this one over here shows the predicted data set where I put them through a classification and regression tool and made predictive maps of what it might look like given the soil forming factors that are present in the area. So I used vegetation, digital elevation models, climate, um, and geology to predict what the soils would look like based on the conditions that are happening in the original data set. This is a map that is also available on databasin.org. Here's the URL right here. You can paste in this URL to your browser and go straight to this map. What it is, it has every one of the vulnerability data sets that I've made. This one's for the north half. 
And you can actually go in there and you can see all of them overlaid with one another or you can click them on and off and only look at this one. So you could, for example, decide you only want to wetlands that might be vulnerable. And so you would click off the other ones and see the ones with hydrograding and you could see where there are wetlands that might be available to, um, might be vulnerable to drought and changes in climate. Uh, another is high risk of water erodibility, sodium absorption ratio, um, gypsum content, calcium carbonate content, where the soils are acidic, where they have low available water storage capacity, where they're very shallow, but they're rated by the NRTS to have high wind erodibility. I also included alkaline soils, which are pH greater than. So you can click these on and off and um, compare them to one another and see where there are several of these factors occurring in one place and what they are. This is another example. This is an example of um, one of the, the these. This is two data sets that are displayed in the map that cover the entire the entire LCC, so that you can see where in the LCC um, soils have high risk of water erodibility. And this was produced using um, both KW factor in combination with um, the slope of the landscape axis at each position. And again, the URL is down here at the bottom. So again, if you wanted to go and look at this map and explore it and use the tools and database and, uh, to analyze it, you should put this in your URL and go there. So the second thing I've done is finish running the vegetation models with the MC1. And so uh, Ender published the paper in Ecohydrology. This is the citation right here. So if you want to go online and uh, take a look at that paper, that's the paper that, I, that uh, details the study that I did about the pain juniper dieback and where I found the tipping point um, in the available soil water capacity. And finally, we have a vegetation. So we take um, digital vegetal, uh, global vegetation model, and we simulate the historic condition and um, the records that show the vegetation um, as it currently is to make sure that we're um, doing a good job of simulating conditions that's working correctly. And then we give it different global circulation models and um, emission scenarios to see uh, how the vegetation is likely to change in the next 30 to 50 years. So here is an example where um, under the CSIRO row MK2 with um, the most severe emission scenario from 2041 to 2050, you can see that there isn't a great deal. There's some change um, that's projected to happen, but there's, you know, definitely a change right in here, and this would be a change from um, forest Holy forest and woodland and some grassland to more shrubland. And there's another change in this area right here. We take the Myrox um, A2 scenario for the same time period. You can see that there's a deal of change in those two areas and a big change in here from um, historic conditions into shrublands. So this would be important. Um, especially, you know, vegetation change is important in the first place, but if we wanted to compare it to the soil vulnerability and see where the soil is likely to be more vulnerable, water or wind, we would need to know if the vegetation was going to um, change in those areas for future management uh, of the soil. Okay. I can open it for questions. Okay, if we have any questions, um Please feel free to unmute your phone, and if for some reason uh, that is not working, then uh, um, feel free to type a question in. Uh, Wendy, I do have a question. Uh, the two climate scenarios that you um, presented in the previous slide were those the um, the were there additional climate scenarios that you're incorporating into this uh, study? Yes, we've done um, probably at least six different climate, climate and emission scenarios. Uh, these are just two that I pulled out really quickly to be able to show. And and just uh, can can you briefly explain the difference between the two models in terms of why why you are seeing a change in the vegetation based on the two models? Sure. So one of them um, has. A um, 
This is a global circulation model that um, incorporates less humidity, and so there's one that's a warmer and wetter scenario, so it, it assumes that things will get warmer, but they won't get much drier. And uh, another one is a warmer, drier scenario. So it assumes that your temperature is going to go up and your precipitation is going to go down. So one of them is maybe in some ways a little more conservative for the environment, and the other one is much more um, aggressive. And the vegetation that we're we're seeing here, this is uh, pinion that's been modeled. No, this is all this is no, this is all vegetation type. Okay, all right. So it's plant functional groups. So it's gonna it's gonna say things like, you know, this dark green right here is a forest, and um, this uh, green right here is what's called a C4 grass. So in in from this one to this one. Just a forest cover and a change from that to maybe a mixed woodland, and then a change from um, the native grasslands that are there to a different kind of grassland. Hey, Thank Wendy, you. this is this is Brett Bruce with the USGS in Denver. Um, I'm just Hi. curious. Um, I would assume that that climate has something to do with the soil that develops in an area, and I'm wondering yes. if uh, the response time of changes in the soil type could mm -hmm. be within the time frame of, of you know, near-term climate change. I'm yes. just curious about that. Yes. yes. So that's actually what got me interested in that because I, I, I realized that the soils have developed over many, many years in response to historic climate, and so their response, um, you know, essentially they're – accustomed to and the plants are accustomed to things going a certain way. And when that changes, both of those things are going to respond pretty quickly. So it's it's fairly straightforward to see a soil which is is accustomed to a certain kind of condition. Um, if those conditions change, it's pretty quick to see that, you know, the soil doesn't, you know, I don't want to personify it too much, but doesn't really understand what's going on. <laughs> Um, and the trees are going to respond differently because they're, they're all adapted and have developed with a certain sort of climate. And when the climate changes, you know, there's a drought, different things are happening, they're going to respond differently fairly quickly. So are the soil changes incorporated in your models as well? Um, yes, that's what we're trying to do. That's what my study is trying to do is trying to show them, you know, trying to show on the short, short term, like, you know, you can take whatever you think the soil texture, et cetera, is, but if the soil has a historic climate regime of a certain kind and that changes, then you ha need to incorporate that into the model because um, that's going to be, you know, important for the current and future vegetation is the new climate regime of the soil. Thank you. Welcome. Any other questions? Uh, Wendy, what is the uh, time frame for when you anticipate the, the project to be wholly completed, all data sets um, available in database and et cetera? Um, I believe it's July of this year. Okay. So folks on the phone, um, you can anticipate that uh, sometime around July then, um, this uh, all, all data sets should be available and uh, reports. What type of uh, uh, reports are you anticipating, or uh, possibly even um, are, are you looking to have uh, some type of journal articles, etc.? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll be writing journal articles and I'll be writing a final report, and I'll make all of them available on database. Excellent. And so, folks, if you just um, want to. Uh, Follow the uh, uh, database and website or follow along with uh, the Southern Rockies LCC website. Um, by all means, um, you can follow along and, and we'll be having updates um, on the completion of the project. I do see we, get a, we got a question come in from Jim Boyle, and Jim is asking, what evidence do you have that a soil type might change in your time frame? What evidence do I have that a soil type might change in my time frame? Correct. What evidence do you have? Oh. Well, I wouldn't say that the soil 
hype is going to change in a short time frame. I would just say that the soil is going to respond in an in these time frame. So the conditions, the historic conditions of the soil and the soil that has developed is developed a certain way. It has certain accumulations. It has certain uh, pathways for the water to go into. If the water isn't going into those pathways, then there's going to be a different hydrological dynamic between the soil and the water. So it's not entirely that the texture of the soil or things that people usually consider to be soil type is going to be is going to change in that time frame. It's that the way that the water is moving and that the trees are accessing um, the water is going to be governed by the conditions of the soil. So it's the the historic condition of the soil probably won't you know, in terms of texture and that sort of thing won't necessarily change in that time frame, but the way that um, the water is being governed and used by the plants in the soil will change. That's more what I'm saying, I guess. Does that okay. make sense? Hopefully, uh, Jim, that answers your question. <laughs> well, perhaps this is Christina Boyd uh, in um, Northern Arizona University, and perhaps you could give us just an example for one scenario of the kind of change, I think you're referring to things like, um, uh, you know, the water holding capacity and that sort right. of thing. Exactly. Perhaps you could be a little more specific about, um, you know, just walk us through a real ecological example. Sure, exactly. Okay, so um, an example, especially uh, particularly with the pinion and juniper that you have in that region is that um, the pinion and juniper are on two different ways to um, to drought. So one of them will close its stomata and try to hold its breath for a little bit so that it doesn't let out the water. Um, and the other is that it will leave the stomata open and just try really hard to use whatever water is available, and that's the juniper, and it's able to persist a little bit more than the pinion, which is more um, susceptible to drought. And there are lots of arguments about whether that has to do with hydraulic failure or carbon starvation. But the issue, um, from my perspective, is that for some reason the tree becomes stressed and it's susceptible to beetle outbreaks and that sort of thing. And that this can be related to how the soils are responding to the change in precipitation. So, for example, if you are, you know, have a tree like the pinion in your region that is dependent on short bursts of summer precipitation, and um, the summer precip precipitation doesn't happen as frequently or at the rate that you want it to, the tree may be able to persist if the soil is deep enough and has the right texture and the right amount of clay and the right amount of sand for the water to stay in the soil from, you know, one period to the next so that it's not – whereas if you have a, a soil that doesn't have that depth or doesn't have those textural conditions that can hang on to the water a little bit longer, it's likely to evaporate or get immediately used up by the trees that are there. And if there isn't enough of it or or, or the um, texture is such that it's hanging on to the water too tightly that's where the, and the trees can't get the water fast enough, then you're going to have a response from the trees that they're going to die back. So, um, so the, and, the, and, and soils are extremely heterogeneous over the landscape. So this could happen in very patchy, you know, disparate places that aren't really next to each other and that sort of thing. You see very patchy dieback and outbreaks of the beetles and that sort of thing because in one area the soils are able to hang on to the water just long enough that the trees can persist through a multi-year drought, where in other areas they're not able to hang on to the water long enough. The trees use the soil, I mean, use the water immediately when it enters the soil or, you know, within a few days, and then they're out and they have soil drought and they can't can't um, produce the resins and have the productivity that they need in order to defend themselves against, you know, say, an insect outbreak. Uh, Dana Price is wondering uh, how soil vulnerability is affected by fire if you have any information on that. Well, I would, uh, and I haven't looked at that um, in particular, but I would say that it's a pretty complex feedback. But if you, for one thing, have, um, you know, you have a dieback of the vegetation or a change in the vegetation, a massive disturbance of the vegetation, uh, such as a fire or, you know, clearing of the land, dieback, et cetera, then you have exposed soil. An exposed soil really leaves it vulnerable to um, wind or water erosion. 
So, um, you know, that's one factor where you're going to possibly lose topsoil and that sort of thing if you have a fire. Um, the other thing is that if it's a very, very hot fire where you've had um, very high high temperatures and um, a lot of fuels burning very intensely, then you can develop what's called um, a, um, a hydrophobic soil, which means that the soil actually forms a very um, dense crust on the surface, and it's very hard for water to infiltrate, so it actually runs off the surface, and it's not available to um, help seedlings propagate and that sort of thing. Yeah, hi, this is Dana, and I was uh, I was anticipating an answer similar to that. Um, so, <laughs> as you know, as you know, in New Mexico, we, we've had some some historically huge fires recently, yeah. and so um, we're dealing with some areas that we'd like to see revegetated. So, mm-hmm. um, of course, yeah, I, I was familiar with the the tendency to develop this hydrophobic layer. Um, yeah. So. It sounds like a soil that maybe wasn't so vulnerable before the fire may now be much more vulnerable, yeah. uh, which makes it all the more harder to get any vegetation established. And I've yeah. also read that getting the veg established is part of what helps um, restore the, the – that yeah. well, remove the hydrophobic layer. <laughs> Condition, yeah, yeah, yeah. What the best thing is to, um, you know – kind of get things moving again. And it can take a couple of years, but it's not impossible. But, yeah, if you, it, it gets really complicated, like you're suggesting. So from the soil's perspective, what's the first thing you want to do? Um, from the soil's perspective, you would um, want, yeah, that's really, really complicated because you <laughs> need to break, you need to break up and get rid of the hydrophobic condition. But if you do that before there's, you know, in, before there's vegetation on it and you expose, you know, the underneath soil that can move to the elements, then you're likely to, you know, get some more erosion going on. So for the time being, in a, in a, in a way, until you can get it vegetated, the, the essential soil crust, the physical soil crust that has established on the top is in some ways protecting the lower soil levels. But so, you know, just thinking off the top of my head at the moment, a possible way of dealing with that might be to only break the crust in the places where you are establishing, trying to establish plants. So if you, um, you know, did a borehole or something in a place that would plant a plant and make it available to water but not break the crust in the, in the inner plant spaces, then that might be a way to start helping to reestablish the vegetation while also protecting the soil in the interim. Yeah, that sounds good. Thanks. You're welcome. This is Jim Boyle. I have a comment on or a question on the uh, soil hydrophobicity. Yes. It's my understanding that hydrophobic conditions are caused by the precipitation of volatilized organic compounds on individual soil particles rather mm-hmm. rather than the creation of a continuous or even so a crust. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So if if my understanding is correct, then uh, eliminating hydrophobic conditions is uh, problematic over a long period of time until potentially microbes break down the hydrophobic coatings on the soil particles. Yeah, so that's another way that a hydrophobic condition can be caused. So in Texas, um, there's been there have been some studies done that have shown the the, the forming of the physical. Um, the crust, and that's, you know, as you would say, an easier thing to deal with. There are also conditions, you know, situations where different chemical compounds, as you're saying, in the plants that have been burned, um, and actually almost an oil forms over the um, soil particles, which is, <laughs> as you're saying, extremely difficult to get rid of or deal with. Yes. Okay, uh, any other questions? All right, uh, thank you. Oh, I see we got one more that just popped up. Christina, you want to comment? Yeah, I just typed it in because it seemed like you were getting questions that way. Um, so, yeah, I just had another question which has to do with freezing and thawing mechanics, which often 
help loosen up soils every spring and make them more able to absorb water. I was wondering if uh, you had thought about that during the model formation, if you're able to incorporate that in the yep. models, you know if that, uh, that freezing thawing differs across different soil types and yep. therefore affect different soil vulnerability under changing climates. Yes, that's a really astute question. Um, I did notice that almost immediately, and it was one of the first questions that I had asked um, because I definitely saw that when a soil um, might change, um, so if, if soil historically has had a cryic um, temperature regime, so meaning it's, it's frozen a good deal of the year, um, and it switches to more of a frigid temperature, temperature regime, so it, it might have some freeze-thaw interaction, but it's not... Um, frozen for long periods of time, that creates a totally different um, condition for the trees. And, in fact, um, one of the areas of dieback that um, we saw in the pinion juniper was the greatest area of dieback, and it's in most models predicted to be um, one of the, you know, in the future in this area in Colorado. Um, it's a very high elevation there, and there's a lot of... Um, freezing and they've had historically frozen soils there and, and in, in the drought top period when the raised te the temperatures were raised, um, they probably went to more of a, a you know, on again, off again, freeze thaw um, condition and the trees really responded negatively in that area. So there was a big, um, I think, response to the change in the freeze thaw dynamics of the soil there. And I think that, that that might have had some sort of um, advantageous effect for the beetles as well. But I'm not sure because I don't, I'm not an entomologist. Can you uh, repost the uh, URLs for the map models? Sure. And uh, also uh, this... Um, this webinar is being recorded. It will be uh, posted on the YouTube channel uh, for the Southern Rockies LCC website, and so you'll be able to go and, and uh, re-see the presentation, rehear it, as well as uh, see all the uh, uh, URLs. But uh, hopefully, Patty, this uh, this uh, provides you with the URL you were looking for. Great, thank you very much. It's on YouTube, yeah. you said. Yes, it will be on YouTube. If you go to the Southern Rockies. LCC website, and that's just southernrockieslcc.org. Okay. Um, there is a, um, a YouTube channel there, and, and we'll, we'll have it posted. I, I don't know how long it'll take to get it posted, but we will post it there. Oh, that would be great. Thank you so much. And again, all, all of the data that I've um, produced to date are in, on databasin.org. You, you can go up to the search window and just put in SR. LCC and it will bring up all of the maps and the gallery um, that contains the different data sets and maps and you can explore them on there and use our tools to um, analyze and overlay them and that sort of thing. Um, you're welcome to email me with questions and um, the vegetation models will also be put up on database and they've just recently been produced they're being refined and we'll put them on database as well. Is your email on that too, Wendy? My email, let's see, yes, it is on here. Okay. Wendy at consplia.org, and that's my phone number right there. Okay. Okay, any other questions? And we'll wrap it up. Thank you. All right. Uh, Wendy, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, very good information, very interesting. I think there's a lot of applicability here. And so, uh, again, thank you for the, the presentation, and uh, we'll end the conference now. Okay. Thank you thank all. You.